And who's here? Is Ken Aaron from L.A.? Alex Staropoulos, or close to that. And uh, Michael Jankowitz from the New York City area. Then back there in the ghetto. And uh, we're going to be talking about cinema today. And the topic is going to be comedy, comedic movies that are about the military or war. And uh, we could start with a list, but I, um, I'd like to do that. Let me start with this list and then, then we'll start to discuss it and uh, argue about it. But first, let me pull up this list. There's the list. And these is, this is just a list I pulled off the internet. Dr. S Number one is Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. And that's actually from back in 1964. That's before they, uh, you know, all the assassinations. Or it's right after the Kennedy assassination, but before uh, RFK and, and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. So it's 1964. Right. And, uh, but it's a very good movie, very funny, kind of... Uh, uh, you know, Peter Sellers was uh, yeah. uh, very significant in that movie because he had two roles. He played the president and a military officer. And then there was Sterling Hayden. No, three, three. Cause three roles. What was the third Strange role? Love. He's Dr. Strangelove, too, remember. He played Dr. Strangelove, too. Okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's you right. You don't remember this, Ken? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, he did such a good job. I don't think of Dr. Strangelove as yeah, Peter Sellers. Yeah, too, yeah. Yeah, but him, you know, it's a great yeah. part he did with the German accent and everything. And Sterling Hayden was a rogue uh, general who yeah. uh, was concerned about the, uh, in, the pollution of his bodily fluids, you know, type of thing, yeah. going off the edge. And he starts World War Three. And it was a very good movie and very funny. Oh, and of course, come back with the name of George C. Scott. He's yeah. he's always great, fun to watch. The kind mm -hmm. of guy you'd really like to spend some time with. He's one of these tall, big, imposing, full of character and personality, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm yep. just, just rambling on here. Yeah. He did he played the right same on. part. He played and he was, and he was told he was told by Kubrick to, you know. Act, act bigger. Act, you know. Act with vigor. Yeah. You know, to to act, you know. Push it. Exaggerate, exaggerate his, you know, characterization. You know, of, of I general, don't think I'm you know? trying to think. Would you ever see him in a movie where he wasn't in charge, or you know, very involved and dedicated and pushing? Uh, One, yeah, yeah. You know, like Patton, or he played a movie where he was. Trying to find out what happened to his daughter in the porn business, you know. Question, Ken. One of his best roles was in the Asphalt Jungle, in which he played a strong arm man for the mob. Now, the, the thing yeah, is, yeah, yeah. But so, so let um, me just go through all ten, and then we'll come back. Well, wait, before you before you do, just remember there's other films that I want to throw in here. Oh, you could yeah, do that. Because, you know, yeah, yeah. there's very few people here. You're going to be on the stage <laughs> for quite a while. Just be have a yeah, little patience. Yeah, yeah. So the other two movies, oh no, it's one movie called The Great Dictator. That's by um, a Charlie Chaplin. Uh, Chaplin. Chaplin. But the interesting thing about it is it's a talkie. It's not a silent movie. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, the general, I'm, I'm going to play a clip from that uh, as soon as I get through this, and then I'll go yeah. on. The general is with uh, Buster, Keaton, Buster Keaton, and I didn't know that was a great, war movie, but it's a civil war. Pilot films, yeah. To Be and Not to Be is a Mel Brooks movie, Mel Brooks and His Wife, and Stalic 17. No, actually, actually, hold, hold it, Ken. To Be and Not to Be was a Jack Benny, Carol Lombard movie. The, remake the one I'm talking about that. here is uh, 1942. Oh, maybe I That's got the... Jack Benny and Carol Lombard. Oh, all right. Well, it was remade by Mel Brooks and... Uh, his wife. Yeah. I not forget. in 1942, yeah. Uh, Maybe not in And Bancroft, yeah. And Bancroft, right. Okay, <clears throat> well, they're both comedies that. about the war and Hitler. And that, oh, how could it have been about Hitler in 1942? I guess it could have been. And then Stalag 17 is a bunch of gruff guys, you know, in a prisoner camp. MASH is just sissy stuff, you know, loving, the, you know, the medical corps. And Three Kings, I always thought, was a great movie. It's a great film, yeah, yeah. Because uh, the director took chances. He put in 
segments there that were like not cinematic. It wasn't part of a regular cinema. He broke the fourth wall. It was one, uh, where he was showing the consequences of somebody getting shot with a bullet, and he went to am animation, showing the breakup and the body and everything. And, uh, you know, in the other scenes in it, it's very good, good movie. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was he was willing to use uh, extra tools to get the message across. Then there's Good Morning Vietnam, which is, you know, I th I don't know why it's on the list, but I mean, because if you love Robin Williams... Well, it's set in the middle of a war. Yeah, but it was, you love Robin Williams, you know, his uh, yeah. psychiatric, you know, hey, oh, no, and I'm talking to this guy, and I, you know, he's got five five different personalities running at the same well, time. Well, it's also because it's anti-military. It's anti-military? Like a lot of the films here, yeah. It qualifies. Go okay, on. it qualifies having to do with the war. Then the uh, uh, Catch-22, which I think is very cerebral and underplayed with Alan Arkin, you know, it's it's uh, ironic. Yeah. Then Tropic Thunder, yeah. which is yeah. just a bunch of uh, actors having fun, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, um, oh, his name, you know, the guy he puts on blackface. And, uh, oh, um, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. Oh, you know who's in this that pushed it? Uh, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, yeah, yeah. He probably came in bald and like, you know. <laughs> yeah. And oh, in Apocalypse Now, go on. And I don't know if that was his real personality. Maybe that was his coming out, you know. I'm a crazy. Okay, we've had enough of that, right? We get the idea. Yep. So, uh, stop the best, there. The best scene is the, is the, the ending speech. Uh -huh. That's a classic, you know. Yeah, well, I, there was a scene where he not felt, he he grabbed the globe and he like, right right yeah yeah he it up in the air. With it. I think it's at the end of this, but I couldn't. Oh, well, almost at the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, no, it's yeah. in the middle. It's in the that's in the middle of the film. You know, it was interesting because he was doing like comedy shtick, pouring water down his pants, and a lot yeah. of you know making fun of the German accent and all of that. The standard yeah. stuff. The interesting thing about. <laughs> about uh, The Great Dictator, which makes it one of the few uh, um, comedies made during the war that actually dealt with it, is that it not only dealt with anti-Semitism, <clears throat> but the main character, which was also played by Charlie Chaplin, was a Jewish barber who looked like the dictator and therefore it was assigned to impersonate him. Um, but it, it was one of the few uh, comedies, actually one of the few films to actually deal with the uh, persecution of Jews and in which the, the, the hero, the Charlie Chaplin's uh, uh, um, hero, was, um, was actually Jewish. So, I mean, there were a lot of war films. In all, in, in all the war films, you had the all-ethnic squad. So one of the characters was usually the tough Jewish guy from the Bronx right. or, or something like that. But here the uh, main character was, and it actually deals with um, um, anti-Semitism. That makes it more of an exception than the rule in the uh, films made during the war. After the war, several, uh, a substantial time after the war, that changed. Do um, you think that was because of an embarrassment about rejecting the refugees from uh, Germany? No, I think it was more of, um, um, I don't want to call it, you know, racist, but um, it was more of like... Um, they didn't want the country to be thinking they were fighting for the Jews to save the Jews. It was oh. fighting against the, the enemy of the United States. And uh, um, they, they really didn't play that up uh, that much at all, even though they, they knew about it. And it may be because a substantial portion of the United States would not have gone to war to save Jews. Well, you know, that the truth of the matter is, I think 30% of the country is German ancestry. They all moved into the Midwest and the northern states. Not not 30%, but yeah, a substantial number, yeah. Well, I uh, just, you know, I since know nobody's you. watching, I'll just make these numbers up. I thought it was 30%. No, 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 it's far lower than that. But, you think? But, oh, yeah. I mean, German, Germanic, like Polish, German, Lithuanian. Well, no, no, Polish isn't German. I mean, Why not? Because if you're Polish... Or Austria, you know. Me. Um, you're talking about German-speaking 
people who came from German speaking countries in which German was spoken, even if it wasn't the main language, but if it was one of the official languages, it's still not 30 percent. But, yeah, it's a substantial uh, uh, minority. And because we didn't with the Japanese, they were, uh, you know, confined to quarters because of threat of sabotage or however you wanted to say it. Uh, you know, I, somebody in uh, in uh, Roosevelt's administration said, well, we're, we're protecting the Japanese. We don't want the Americans to seek revenge on the Japanese. So we'll yeah, put them in right. these in German camps. But we didn't do that with the Germans. I don't think, but maybe it, we did. Maybe we put a certain amount of did, Germans because with German. New York had New York had bond, bond meetings, the ger German meetings in New York. <clears throat> you know, some of those German restaurants on 92nd, 96th Street. You know, there was a big German movement in New York City and other places. So maybe they did uh, arrest some Germans. I don't know. Relatives of mine used to beat up Nazis on the street. It was... Um, oh, it was come on. Thing to do. Um, <laughs> it, it was just... That was just... They just used them as practice. Uh, oh. But the idea is that um, it wasn't that there was a lot of you know, Nazis. It's just that the United States at that time and, and for years afterwards was they said one third of the United States was potentially anti-Semitic. Um, and we know that more than one third is more than potentially racist. Oh, you uh, mean like, uh, let's say Christian, uh, Jews killed Jesus, that kind of a thing? Yeah, well, all types of anti-Semitism. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but the thing was, so they, they, they tried to play down the fact that um, we were doing, you know, the, the U.S. was fighting the war to save the Jews, but they did, as with these all-ethnic squads and, you know, in, in these war movies, they did, you know, say there were Jewish guys fighting um, along with everybody else, Jewish Americans. Um, <coughs> um, so it yeah. was just, uh, I mean, you have to remember also, there were um, people who even though they did not necessarily support, I mean, there were some people who did support it, but there were people who did not ne necessarily support uh, segregation in the armed forces, but who kept it going uh, because, again, nobody wanted to rock the boat. Everybody wanted to keep everybody, you know, you know, geared up for the war, keep the propaganda going, and therefore they they turned a blind eye to American racism. Right. Okay. Hey, I got to ask, uh, since we're just talking about the war, Alex, I, I'm i assuming you have a Greek heritage, right? Yeah. Okay, so where, what, what was the position of uh, Greece Greece in the war? Were the, were the Allies or just they were just invaded? Were they neutral? They were occupied by the Germans and the Italians and the Bulgarians. So they were, so they they were, far, they were on the Allied side, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but they were just overwhelmed and conquered and, uh, and occupied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And who were the third ones? The, the Italians, the Germans, and the who? And the Bulgarians. Bulgarians. Okay. Who are Axis. He tried an occupation zone. I didn't know Bulgaria was part of the Axis. Yeah. I've never uh, heard that. No, like, like Romania and Hungary. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and Croatia. Oh. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> And a couple of the Arab states. I don't remember which ones. Well, you know, well, all right. You know, I mean, they're Arabs, but no Arabs. I mean, there was an attempt at a revolt, but that got squashed by the British. So, so, uh, <laughs> so Greece kind of like, well, there was, there was, uh, I mean, you guys are into all the military stuff. I've seen military programs yeah. about the allies coming up from the so south from after you know, after they got <clears throat> control of Northern Africa, come up it, through the belly. Hitler, Hitler left up. Greece in '44 because the you know the Soviets were moving into the Balkans, and then um, the, the British basically entered Athens. Uh, I think April '44, and then there was a a, a brief struggle between the communist um, you know uh, guerrillas and the British government. Oh. That that plays into the later civil war in Greece in the 40s. Okay, let's get back to the movies here. I'm just going to read these real fast. Mike's going to say what should be added, but I want you guys to tell me which ones you don't think are worthy of being this high. So it's the strange love, the great dictator, the general, to be or not to be, style of 17, MASH, 
Three Kings, Good Morning Vietnam, and Catch-22 and Tropic Thunder. Who doesn't belong here? Oh, I'd they, say all, they, all, they all belong here. I okay. Know. What is missing? What is missing? Mike? Okay. Uh, Mike. I'll tell you what, 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 some things <clears throat> that are missing, but I should say we should uh, make a distinction between what they call service comedies, uh, in which is what comedy is about yeah. uh, the military and fighting the war, and political among other things, political films like The Great Dictator, um, which was uh, um, <clears throat> wasn't about the what it was like to be in the military or anything like that, but it was um, it was a political and to be or not to be also. They were political film comedies, politically anti. -Nazi. Doctor Strange Love too. It was anti nuke. It did deal with the service and the fact that you had uh, Mandrake. <clears throat> Um, the RAF liaison F officer and, and General Ripper, and then you also had um, George Scott's character. So the military was heavily involved in that. Yeah, but, and the command yeah. center and everything, and nuclear and then, power, nuclear weapons. It was anti. Yeah. It was anti war. And then you have you could also add films like um, Woody Allen's Bananas. Yeah, well, the guerrilla That's war true. is is a big part of the plot, and you know. Uh, the gorilla a fictional, war. fictional, you know, Latin I, uh, American country. No, 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 no. Woody Allen is a category, just like sci-fi <laughs> or cowboys, and you got Woody Allen. You also throw in, well, it's it's not direct to the movie, but you know, his love and death, which of course is set, you know, during the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, a parody yeah. of War and Peace. I'm going to yeah. other things. I know. It's Woody Allen. That's a category. It is a category. It's a genre. So come on, Mike. What are you withholding? Well, okay. What's the, what's well, the movie all, that's supposed to be there? After, <laughs> after the war, you had a, a slew of comedies um, that dealt with the war. Um, one of the biggest moneymakers, um, which I talked about before, was a movie called Operation Petticoat uh, with Cary Grant and Tony Curtis um, and, and was one of the biggest moneymakers of 1959. It was a hilarious movie. I mean, these, again, weren't great films, so to speak, but they were, uh, you know, highly entertaining. <coughs> Tony Curtis also did Captain Newman, M.D. Uh, Cary Grant did Father Goose. In the 50s and 60s, you had a slew of movies. I mean, Jim Hutton did, did a um, film called The Horizontal Lieutenant. Um, you know, this, this... Ford did a couple of... You had, you had, you had all these films... And some of them based on plays, some of them based on novels, but that they were <clears throat> they were basically either satires or comedies about what it was like to serve in the Second World War, sometimes in the First World War. <laughs> had a, a musical called Oh, What a Lovely War, and then another film called How I Won the War. These are, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the difference was that during the war, the comedies, Robert Walker did the Private Hargrove series, uh, um, Robert it was with King and Wynn, and um, uh, you had, uh, again, like you said, to be or not to be, there were lots of, you know, the Francis, the talking mule, et cetera, et cetera. But the comedies during the war, during World War II, whenever there was a war going on, the comedies were such that it was about, you know, like with Abbott and Costello, about people trying to adjust to the army. The army, the military, was seen as a good thing. They were benevolent and they the um the main characters were having problems they were either bumbling or just trying to uh, uh adjust themselves to the army um and then that that was the goal so that they could become good soldiers yeah, I, I, yes yes i've got listed uh, with under honorable mention let me just go over the dates buck private abbott and costello 1942 and you're in the army now, Jimmy Durante, Phil Silvers, Jane Wyman, 1941. And this is, I think it, because I love them, everybody does. The Flying Deuces, Laurel and Hardy, 1939. They joined the Foreign Legion, the French Foreign Legion. And it was a remake of a film, the short they did in 1931. And then, uh, <coughs> well, you know, because your Petticoat Junction or whatever was <coughs> 1959. Petticoat, Petticoat Junction. It's a whole other thing. Yeah, I know. It was something about petticoat, right? Operation Petticoat. But, uh, you know, that's kind of 59's getting out there. Uh, but in, in terms of World War II references. 
and well, the uh, Francis movies were like 1950. This is because Petticoat, uh, Operation Petticoat, that's after the uh, Korean War, yes. isn't it? Well, that the point I'm trying to make is that during the war, okay, it was yeah. very, um, the main characters were simply bumblers or stumblers trying to, you right. know, right. Uh, adjust to the military so they could be good soldiers. After the war, the attitude with most of the comedies was people trying to get one over on the military. Either oh, they like were Bilko. Men or they were they right. going on. Sergeant Bilko on television was a perfect example of that. Um, in other words, people who were, you know, uh, uh, Gomer Pyle. Or, Gomer Pyle, or, right? Gomer, let's let that one go. But, um, but the fact is, in the movie, so in Operation Petticoat, even though Cary Grant was the noble commander, um, although very funny at it, but it was, but Tony Curtis was kind of this con man who was trying to get what the submarine, their their U.S. submarine needed by opening a gambling casino and uh, um, stealing and, and conning, conning uh, his way into things. Similarly with Captain Newman, M.D., which was really a comedy drama, um, and Father Goose. <laughs> Cary Grant played somebody who did. These are guys who like didn't have any illusions about the war. Um, they were willing to fight it. They they were one, thought knew the bad guys are the bad guys, etc. But they were <coughs> trying to buy the best way they can um, to outwit the system, so to speak. And that was after the war because again, the audience they were appealing to was people who had been in the service, and people <coughs> who had been in the service knew that. Um, that the military wasn't this noble, forthright, you know, um, steady, you know, uh, uh, bastion of goodness. Um, but so they had to deal with the reality of people's experience in the service and in the war. So, uh, are there any 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 comedies that you think should be way up higher in this list? Well, that I isn't think, on the list. I think of one go ahead, Alex. that they don't have. What? What's that? Because it's nobody ever thinks of it as uh, anti-military because it's done as a straight, straight satire. I mean, it's done. It's a uh, Paul Verhoeven Starship Troopers. If you ever seen that, that which is oh yeah, of, yeah, 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 that's one of right. the great military satires ever. But the way he did it is he because he's um, Verhoeven. He survived the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands, so he has particular attitudes about fascism. But the way he did, he parodied fascism, was to basically, you know, based on the science fiction novel of Robert Heinlein about, you know, a future war against, you know, a bug. Yeah, and but he followed the book he, pretty closely. He treated it completely serious, like what would... Right. What would you really think if you were in that kind of essentially... I know, I'm kind of insulted society. that you call and it a does, comedy. You know, like he I has didn't... some, he's part of that is like he has some great scenes of like kind of their propaganda that yeah. come across just like our, you know, the kind of propag, you know, the kind of military propaganda we do for recruitment, you know, the, all those army ads. Well, it's no, no, wait a like second. That, but with a fascist twist to it. I can, that was I, a I give... got a clip for it if you want to, if you. Well, uh, yeah, play. if you want to play the clip, go I, ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I missed something there. I, there was a glitch. Oh, well, we're going to see uh, it now. But you've do you you've seen Starship Troopers, Mike, right? By Paul Verhoeven. Oh, make sure make sure you got the uh, sound going correctly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let me do a share. Okay. I I come, I'm kind of insulted that you call it a comedy because I use it as a, a comedy. It's a, a motivating satire. movie. He just played. He plays because you know, just like with say um, his RoboCop. Right. Uh, he, he plays, plays these funny he's commercials. He funny. doesn't. He's not. He's not. You know. He uh, he plays it like you know. You assume that you how you would be in this world. Did so he, it's, it's not. It's not from the outside. Right. Um, you know, comedy. But he just plays it straight. And and by you know creating a, a world, a fascist world, essentially, he's satirizing it. Did he also do that one with Schwarzenegger, uh, Total Recall? He did Total Recall, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they, the all three of those had the yeah, same yeah, kind yeah. of comedy commercials. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, commentate, uh, commentary on life. Uh, yeah, Here we go. Propaganda. 
Young people from all over the globe are joining up to fight for the future. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part too. <laughs> They're doing their part. Like, you know, kid are soldiers you? for Join laugh, the mobile you know. infantry and save the world. Service guarantees citizenship. to hold it citizen rule people making a better tomorrow <laughs> a murderer was captured this morning and tried today guilty sentence death execution tonight at six all net all channels <laughs> Out of the ashes of Buenos Aires comes first sorrow, then anger. The only good bug is a dead bug. In Geneva, the Federal Council convenes. We must meet the threat with our valor, our blood, indeed with our very lives, to ensure that human civilization, not insect, dominates this galaxy now and always. <laughs> Sky Marshal Deans announces plans for an offensive against Clandathu, source of the bug meteor that destroyed Buenos Aires. Every day, federal scientists are looking for new ways to kill bugs. Your basic arachnid warrior isn't too smart, but you can blow off a limb... ...and it's still 86% combat effective. Here's a tip. Aim for the nerve stem and put it down for good. Would you like to know more? Everyone's doing their part. <laughs> the war effort needs your effort. At work, at home, in your community. <laughs> Crisis for humankind. Fleet officials admit they underestimated the arachnids' defensive capability. Accepting responsibility for Clendathu, Sky Marshal Deans resigns. His successor, Sky Marshal Tahat Maru, outlines her new strategy. To fight the bug, we must understand the bug. We can ill afford another Clendathu. Would you like to know more? Federal scientists struggle to explain the intelligent military actions of the arachnids. When a colony reaches a certain size, 300 generations or something, it gets smarter. Insects that with intelligence? Have you ever met one? I can't believe I am hearing this nonsense. Would you just this wait is the most a moment. Conversation I have ever had. There is some kind of bug that we haven't seen yet. A leadership cast, a, a hive brain. Brain bugs? Frankly, I find the idea of a bug that thinks offensive. What mysteries will the brain bug reveal? Federal scientists are working around the clock to probe its secrets. Once we understand the bug, we will defeat it. We have the ships. We have the weapons. We need soldiers. Soldiers like Lieutenant Stack Lumbry. We're in the target area now, Captain. Captain Carmen Ibanez. This is the captain speaking. All personnel prepare for trial. Soldiers like Private Ace Levy and Lieutenant John Rico. Come on, you ape! You wanna live forever! We need you all. Service guarantees citizenship. Should have got yeah, an Academy Award. Completely or... straight, but it works as a as a satire because he takes it seriously. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm thinking of joining up right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because again, they're just he just you know what what would a so 
again, and of course, the interesting thing is that the original work from which he's drawing, you know, um, Robert Highland's Robert Highland really believed that a, 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 a good, it would be a, you know, to fight communism, it would be a good thing for us to essentially adopt, a fat, create a fascist America. So he was, so it kind of benefits from the fact that, yeah, Highland was, was actually very serious about, you know, that as a realistic prospect, that that would be, and that would be a good thing. So his kind of source material that he's relying on kind of, you know, gives him a pretty good, you know, if you've ever read the the, the novel, which is very good. Well, I mean, one of the things in that... Heinlein kind of started off as uh, somewhat normal, and then he started going off the deep end. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, in the U.S., service guarantees citizenship, too. Yeah, 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 which is part of a fascist ideal of, yeah. You can't be a citizen if you don't, you know, serve in the military. No, no, no. I'm saying if you're a foreigner, you know, the Philippines, a well, lot of yes, Filipinos yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. Mexicans, if you yeah. serve in the military, you you, you, you can have gain a, citizenship. A faster Although, again, Trump, Trump, remember, Trump changed that. Caveat, Trump, Trump, Caveat, Trump, yes, Trump blew that out the window uh, for a while. Oh. He, there were sir, guys who served. He expelled, um, you know, undocumented yeah. uh, immigrants who who hmm. joined up. And you know when you when you mentioned Trump, I did something I wanted to say before when I was watching the uh, the dictator, the great dictator. I was yeah. a lot of that was very Trump esque. You know the exaggeration sure. of like well, we're the best, we're on top, we got this right, is the greatest, you know, you know that kind of a Trump, narcissistic Trump assertion. Trump himself has been compared to Mussolini in his in his style, yeah. in his demeanor. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you know who knows. Uh, who knows where he got it from? But anyway, um, but okay. As as so, oh no! Again, um, as Jim tells the story, well, and I think it's been some of it, one of his biographers, or or one of the the guy he did, who did the his the ghost wrote his book said um, that Trump used to sleep with a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. Or, yeah, or I think his wife might have. Ivana might have said something like that in the divorce procedure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, so, did, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, but he came out more like Mussolini. I read the Communist Manifesto, you know. Um, so you got you got to be educated. Well, but, but so the point is that uh, no, the he, point is though that he we, believed it. <laughs> well, I don't know how did yeah, yeah. how do you determine that? He thought Hitler. You know, he's one of these people who thinks I, Hitler. I, Hitler got it right. You know. <laughs> why don't we? Um, why don't we uh, um, get back to the subject? And yeah, okay. So that's, you're right. That's not considered by the movie industry to be a comedy, but it is. It's satirical, right? That's the point. It's satirical. And there's other movies like that that are satirical. A lot of sci-fi movies. That are satirical, even though they come across as being very serious, but they were, that they were meant as satire. Right. Um, but... When we're dealing with uh, um, comedies about uh, about war and about the military, um, there are, I mean, there are plenty of comedies about the military alone, the military even in peacetime. Um, and there are plenty, there's God knows how many films where, the, where even though it's not about the military or about the war, where there is satire within them. So... Um, there's a, I mean, as far as the films that are dealing with, specifically with the military, um, there is, in times of war, the military is, you know, in other words, you can't make fun of the military. In other words, using Dr. Strange as, as an example, <coughs> you know, that film would never have been made, even if it wasn't about nuclear war, but the portrayals of the, um, military leaders would never, um, that would have never been allowed during World War II, uh, World War One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, even during World War II, if you go on YouTube, you can find a lot of cartoons that were made by the Army for, for soldiers, telling them to, to uh, you know, avoid getting involved with prostitution because it yeah. could be a spy or you could get a disease or they could kill you. And also they use terms like the Japs, you know, they, they ridicule the Japs if they have thick glasses and buck teeth. And, uh, you know, and actually, uh, you know, 
things that uh, bolster America, the Yankee Doodle Dandy, you know, and he comes in. If you could put the ants in his Japans, that, that famous line from me, <coughs> uh, Mr. And President. By the way, um, the, the, the British um, in the post-war period um, had several comedies. I know the, the, the Carry On yeah. Yeah. comedies, the Ealing comedies. The so Carry On were, comedies were military? They were like nurses, hospitals. No, no, no. Some of them dealt with the military. Um, and, um, I mean, there was a standard, you know, the, the standard uh, um, satirizing. Uh, but the, of, car uh, the Carry uh, On movies were a form of soft pornography, as I remember as a teenager. They always oh, yeah. had very, very well-developed female characters as nurses flirting. It was kind of like a Benny Hill flirting. thing, you know. Um, um, I hate to say it, but that they were... That wasn't really pornography. You you could have gone if you were looking for pornography. You were looking in the wrong place. No, I know there were the the nudist colony movies and stuff. But I'm saying it was it was, uh, uh you know, sexy, softcore. Pe Peter Sellers, for instance, who by the way, when he made Doctor Strangelove, the uh, uh, famous quote attributed to Stan uh, Stanley Kubrick was um, working with Peter Sellers about working with Peter Sellers. He said. It was like getting three actors for the price of six. Um, <laughs> but Peter Sellers, when he, he started out, when he was stationed with the RAF in, um, um, in India and Burma uh, during the war, um, he, well, actually, I think he went there later. But anyway, he was a uh, mechanic with the RAF, and he used mm -hmm. to entertain, you know, do his, make fun of... Um, of superior officers and things like that to look sketches to entertain his uh, fellow soldiers. That's um, very dangerous. I used to do that at work. You usually don't get promotions or raises. I don't think <laughs> you Peter don't make fun of your boss. boss. <laughs> I don't think Peter Tellers was worried about a promotion at that point. Um, yeah. The um, but but later on when he got into the Goon Show and everything, and then the comedy that evolved from that, you can see it in Monty Python, the um, the standard. Um, um, comedic sketches about the military where, you know, the, the, you know, stiff upper lip, uh, you know, <clears throat> ramrod straight British officer versus the, um, the regular troops, the cockneys or whatever, who are just, you know, they're just not on the same page. Let's put it that way. Um, but there were several comedies, uh, uh, actually, and the British, there was a, um, a, uh, British comedy uh, group called the Crazy Gang, um, which did a couple of movies where they were wound up fighting Hitler or something like that. There were there were several comedies, but they all went uh, even both the British and the Americans. You also had in Canada, you had um, um, comedy, uh, you know, comedians who would go over to entertain the troops, and they, it was allowed to a certain degree to make fun of superior officers just as long as it didn't go too far. Right. But, you know, to appeal to the troops. But You know, um, there, there, there's one vehicle which we didn't discuss at all. It's Hogan's Heroes. That was the name of it. Well, Hogan's Because they, they, these were like prisoners of war in a German POW camp. And they, you know, you know the Germans were all stupid. And they, well, you know. Actually, they, yeah. Hogan's right? Heroes was lambasted for being, uh, having two goofy and um not taking it serious not taking it seriously especially with the nazis but if you look at a film like which you brought up which is a play also uh like stalag 17 which yeah it wasn't a comedy both on stage and in the film but it was a comedy with serious overtones <clears throat> and, um and uh but you you know you have situations there where the germans are played somewhat as buffoons, but as kind of nasty buffoons. So, um, you know, they, you, you didn't sympathize with them. Well, that's, you know, that's a big topic them, for the military. And I think the people who are involved with this activity we're involved in is so oriented towards the military of like, what is the viewpoint of the war, Second World War, <clears> even <throat> the First World War from the Axis side? from the German side. And I've seen a little bit of that in certain documentaries, but you know, they have a point, a point of view too. And I don't mean uh, the Germans producing a movie of, you know, guilt 
oh, you know, it's terrible and we were bad. But like a movie, you know, besides the propaganda movies, you know, the big meetings, I forget the, the lady's name who made it, it was famous for that. But, you know, movies, I, there was one about a tank. It was called Tank. And there was one about two tanks trying to get, you know, rescue some guy in the middle. So every once in a while, you'll get movies about Russians or Germans that are sympathetic to their viewpoint, at least considerate. Um, well, well the, in Germany, Das Boot, das Germany, Boot, right? Das Boot was a submarine. Das Boot could not be considered a comedy. In Germany, um, in Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan during the war, you didn't, I mean, you could not do a comedy <clears throat> that was <throat> at all critical of the military, the Nazi party, or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, if as as constricted as the uh, films made on the Allied side were, um, it was it was in the cause of propaganda, perhaps, but it was not nearly as restrictive as. Well, the Germans could have made funny movies about the Jews if they wanted to make a ridicule. They could have made propaganda movies making fun of Jews or gypsies or whatever else they targeted. And uh, but I understand. No, I'm talking about yeah, after yeah. the war. After the war. You know, because there's a lot of people who survived. It's, uh, you know, this Operation Paperclip. There's a lot of Nazis who didn't get, you know, didn't yeah. serve any time. And so they're still around. And I'm sure there was people from, in the movie industry. And yeah, but guys none, that, of, you know, none of them were sympathetic towards the... Uh, towards the uh, Nazis? Towards the Axis. However, on the Japanese, uh, um, in, in, the, in the war against Japan, you did have... I mean, there was, I remember there was a film called The, the Wackiest Ship in the Army. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Wackiest Ship in the Navy. Was it of the Army? No, no, no. The Wackiest Ship in the Navy would have made sense. It was called The okay. Wackiest Ship in the Army. It was this about, is not McHale's Navy. This is different. Okay. No, McHale's <laughs> Navy. Um, um, curiously enough, um, a lot of the comedies, <laughs> a disproportionately large amount of the, of, of the war and service comedies made after the war, um, the ones that dealt with the war at sea usually dealt with boats. You didn't have a lot of comedies after the war that took place on aircraft carriers or something. They mainly were submarines or PT boats. It was, you know, smaller scale. Um, but, um, no, with these... Uh, um, we were these, talking about foreign, you know, oppositions. Oh, that, what kind, you know, German, Japanese, or even Italian advocate making movies from the other side the other viewpoint to some degree you know to some degree yeah. what was a german viewpoint you might well, get a little bit i think they had a character in uh the spielberg movie uh you know there was a good german in there or the uh, good german you know that that, that yeah, concept the good, the good german was anti-nazi or at least dismissive of the nazis um, well, for, all right. for instance, in the wackiest ship in the army, you had a character who was a Japanese uh, um, officer who had been educated in the United States, who basically says when they're, um, you know, when they're under attack, the, you know, he kind of, he captures the boat when he's under attack. They said, oh, you know, Jack Lemmon or something, you're asking if he's going to die for the emperor. And he says, what are you kidding? And he jumps overboard. Um, <clears throat> the, you know, in other words, so there was a little... Uh, uh, playing on that, but whatever it was, it still wasn't supportive or sympathetic to the German or Japanese war effort. Um, so, and and usually these comedies were supportive of the war effort, but they could just be more satirical about the military itself. Well, that's kind of some kind of a censorship. I mean, it, you know, it's always good to see something that's over the edge. I mean, they do that in horror movies. They cut people's limbs off, and you know they do all kinds of things that exceed uh, the, the, the standards that an audience would have as to what you could put on a screen. But to see, I mean, I, it's true. If there's a guy who's, you know, wants to take over the world because, uh, you know, because uh, he's a supremacist like a German or, or Japanese, they might be a character in a movie, but they're all always considered to be crazy, and they have to be defeated. But they're they're in all of the superhero movies. You always have a big villain who wants to conquer the planet or the universe and and get rid of mankind or half of mankind. 
that's in all of these uh, superhero movies and lots of action right. flicks and and uh, Mission Impossible flicks, you know. Uh, the, the, so the, the villain, but it's always the villain, and there's never any sympathy for them, except in sometimes vampire movies, you will develop some sympathy for Dracula. I remember <laughs> Louis Jordan made a uh, Louis. Uh, did I get no it right? Such, Louis Jordan. He played no, Dracula. Don Louis Jordan. Louis Jordan. He yeah. played Dracula, and yeah. he had this one thing that didn't come from the book. He says, you know. I only kill to stay alive. It's not like I'm in the army and I'm dropping bombs and killing children and women, hundreds of people at a time. I just once in a while I, I have to, I have to kill to stay alive, you know. So he he developed some sympathy and he was so you know how cool Louis Jordan is. He's yeah. so elegant. So he was like a sophisticated Dracula. So you yeah, will get that and that they, that. Um, the one with Patterson and uh, the, the, the one that, uh, the vampire love story, you know, so you will get a villain sometimes that is more sympathetic, but not with, not with the World War One or Two or even the Korean War. The Koreans mm -hmm. are considered to be absolute maniacs. You know, maybe they are, but. Uh, well, actually, um, it's interesting that in the, um, in the 50s and, and predominantly, um, um, late 50s, early 60s, mid 60s, you started having these uh, films like Strange Love um, that were critical or satirical about the um, about the U.S. military. But on the whole, <clears throat> the comedies, uh, at least, and some of the uh, serious ones that were critical of the U.S. military, uh, several of them had to be made in England. First of all, they couldn't, um, mm. and it wasn't because of propaganda per se. They couldn't get the cooperation of the U.S. The military, of the DOD, Department of Defense. Oh, really? Uh, okay. So, yes, Dr. Strangelove was made in England. A serious, not yeah. a comic at all, a serious film, which we were talking about last night on, on the show, which, um, with Richard Widmark and Sidney Poitier called The Bedford Incident, had to be made in England because it presented a very critical um, um, negative portrayal of an American uh, yeah. um, destroyer commander. These films... And on occasion, the, um, <clears throat> the DOD found, or or the CIA found ways to influence some of those, well... Uh, they tried. More negative... Well, I know they're very, co they're very like cooperative we, with Top Gun, we, you know? I don't know if you guys know, but um, Three Days of the Condor yeah. actually had some CIA involvement to it. So they were actually weren't all that unhappy with you know because no, no 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 it's a good recruitment it's it doesn't it doesn't deal. it doesn't it doesn't it depicts you know it's there's a trope in those kinds of films where it's always a rogue faction of the CIA when exactly. of course the CIA itself does you know um, you know as as people pointed out you know the, the, there is no such thing as the rogue CIA the CIA does what the president tells it to do so all the nasty stuff that we found out you know killing Lumumba uh, trying to kill Castro you know um, uh, doing torture experiments doing actual torture funding and supporting death squads that stuff the the, the CIA does at the best of you know the president and the U.S. government and the capitalist system, but it, it's you know it's it's a good way for them to kind of you know um, you know put out some stuff that that is you know a little bit critical, but then throws it in the direction of okay these are rogue elements the real CIA wouldn't you know try and um, you know do all this nasty stuff <clears throat> and of course the reality is the the real CIA does the kind of nasty stuff all the time and does it every day of the of the year, you know. But that's but, what they're they're a covert action agency. That's what they however, do. However, there were some comedies done yeah. um starting in the mid to late sixties. I mean there was one goofy, silly comedy, but actually kind of funny at, at points called John Goldfarb Please Come Home. With Shirley MacLaine, Richard Kretter, right. Peter Houston. Or you can think of a, um, the, the Mouse That Roared. Well, and The Mouse That Roared also, yeah. But that was in England. 
But John, uh, but in this gold bar, <clears throat> they make fun of everybody in the U.S. military, the U.S. government, um, yeah. U.S. the CIA, the CIA, the the character who worked for the uh, who was the head of the CIA was actually his name was heinous overreach. Um, <laughs> right. So I mean. But they were, you had these farces. They didn't always do well. You had a movie then starting in the 70s. Once to Vietnam, once, you know, we got, you know, Dr. King and RFK had been assassination, assassinated in addition to JFK and the Vietnam War was going strong. Then the floodgates kind of opened a bit. So you had movies like The President's Analyst. Which, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the bad guy would, turned out to be... Um, uh, uh, the AT and T or the phone company. The phone company, yeah. Right, yeah. The phone company. Um, What's the guy's name? The guy it. who played that, you know, very slick, the analyst, James Coburn. Uh, James, Com James Coburn. Coburn and Coburn, yeah. And oh yeah. In the yeah. in his movies, very like, ironic, very Coburn ironic. <laughs> it, was, it was a very funny movie, and the because um, the president a lot of fun of the episode. the president just a spoiler alert. The president is really like from Disneyland, Abraham Lincoln in Disneyland. He's a simulcon. He's a puppet, a robot. No, no. The head of the phone company is a recording. A, no, no, no. There was a scene where he goes to see. Oh, the president. Uh, okay. No, there was a robot. Maybe, maybe right. Yeah. Maybe it was a representative from the phone company. It was but it was, a, it was a robot. It was. Well, he was. He basically said, I don't believe it. He's a recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, but the fact is that you had these, these kind of like, I mean, in the in the Flint movies, Our Man Flint right. and It Like Flint, which were takeoffs on James Bond and the Man from Uncle, right, 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 and that trend. But and they were really predominantly, I mean, they were an action, you know, they were super spy flicks, but they were also <clears throat> comedic elements, and sometimes they would. You know, I mean, yeah, in like he was making a lot of fun of the American military. And yeah, whereas the, uh, movies, movies like or TV shows like The Prisoner were more serious. You know, the they were like were crazy, serious. but not comedies. <laughs> you know, The Prisoner had some comedy in it. There were some yeah, satirical maybe. episodes. That yeah, well, every every TV, you know, people. Star Trek will have comedy in it. Everything has yeah. some comedy. <laughs> but, you know, comedy relief like the. But those. Do you know they they just get off topic there in terms of comedy? Star Wars, right? Star Wars, the first Star Wars was based on a Kurosawa movie called the. Uh, it's oh, about it's it's a, it's the, the golden several. the golden yeah um, the golden um, treasure. Uh, but the point was in, no, in no, knowing no, no. that. It's, um, what's it? it's it's um, I forget. Yeah, it's this. It's. It's something about it's, um, getting a chest. It's with um, Mufune. He's um, he's yeah. like um, a warlord who's yeah. He's he's trying to save um, this princess. No, no, I'm thinking about a different one. Wait a second. Let me just tell no, you. No, the no, no. It's, on it's it. not. It's oh, I, I'll. I'll, I'll uh, yo, it'll come to you. I just count. No, it's name. that's the one. That's the one that he. There were that two. He said, that, there were two characters. Two, two characters that were bumbling characters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And there, they, but they there just are two came upon in the original in the Kurosawa film. That's right, and that was uh, meet uh, the CP three O, CP three O, yeah, and R two D two, yeah. And the thing is, if you watch the Star Wars movie, Hidden Fortress, it's Hidden Fortress, that's Hidden it. Fortress. That's it. If you yeah. watch the Star Wars movie, you'll see whatever drama is going on, or it's a battle between yeah. the stormtroopers and the rebels, and then boom. They throw in a thing with C-3PO. I don't think we should be here. You know, so they throw in this yeah, little yeah. comedy, which is something that uh, Lucas picked up from the, uh, well, that, the, the Japanese movies that in the middle, even in a, you know, it could be like Zulu movie, just carnage well, and fighting. Relief. But they throw in a little bit of comedy like, you know, right. oops, I dropped something, you know, or something. That's known in the profession as comic relief. So right, yeah, comic right. relief, right. So you're going to have that in a lot of movies. A drama uh, Lu Lucas does it slightly different comedy. different because in in the in the Kurosawa both of the that, um, both of them the the you know the peasant characters are basically all about 
Um, they're not. They're, you know, they're cowards and, and yeah. greedy. That they're that's why they go along with it. Kind of, um, um, and, and in Star Wars, you can at least say R two D two is is kind of a heroic character. Yeah, yeah but C three PO is a coward. C three PO who's the coward, but he's right. yeah. he's yeah. not greedy either. So it's you know they don't they take that out you know. And the military is included in it, and that's the point. And by the way, I say I'm I'm saying that if we don't. Um, you know, if each person is going to talk on their own. Um, yeah, yeah, well, that's okay. It's a small group. We can interrupt each other moderately. Moderately. Uh, now, moderately. It's okay. We're not going crazy. But if you, you want to say go over something and you think we got cut off, okay. go ahead. Why don't we get back on topic? Go ahead. Um, so, um, because we're running out of time here. Yeah. So, the fact is that we went over, I mean, just some... Uh, of the films. By the way, Catch-22, which we didn't deal with um, um, that much, is actually based on the book. And yeah. it was not considered that successful an adaptation of the book. The book was a very difficult book to um, adapt. Um, and it tried to keep the satire. And by the time Catch-22 came out, of course, you're talking about a different era. It, that was already 1970. And we have we were in the middle of the Vietnam War and the anti-Vietnam War um, demonstrations and the counterculture movement. Um, so you know everything was fair game at that point. Um, the military probably wasn't too happy with that. Um, they tried again when you started getting into things like fighting the Nazis or something. Um, they had to tread very carefully. They had to make sure. Uh, well, they, they wanted to make sure that. They were still being anti-Nazi, but that, you know, they were just making fun of the military's attempts. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that hurt uh, the film Kelly's Heroes at the box office uh, was that at the end of the film, they actually joined forces with an Waffen SS guy with a Tiger tank to break open the bank, um, yeah. uh, to use the Tiger tank to break open the bank. And although the makers of the film said, no, we weren't endorsing the Waffen SS, it made people too uncomfortable. Um, so, you you know, it was fair game to, let's say, if you were making a comedy about World War II, um, it became fair game to make fun of the military and how we were doing things. But to make they made sure that they uh, kept in mind that, you know, that it was still anti-Nazi, the Nazis were bad and horrible and needed to be defeated. Same to a certain degree with Japan. Um, and the fact is that it it really just opened up. I mean, the films by that time, by the late, very late 60s, early 70s, opened up where the military and the American military industrial establishment became fair game. They started, it started out being fair game because movies like Strange Love became popular um, and the movies that were making fun of it. So the military had to kind of like pull back and not be so sensitive, so to speak, about any um, comedic criticism of them or, or, or how they were, their structure or anything like that because... Uh, well, they didn't want anything interfering with the recruitment, so they didn't want they don't want a comedy where the uh, you know planes blow up or something. That, you know, it's dangerous to get in the military. You're going to be poisoned, or you know the, all of the all of the drugs they give you and stuff like that. You know, but well, do you think that? But the the thing is, a movie that, like Hogan's Heroes, don't you Hogan's think it Heroes. lessened the animosity towards the Germans? I mean, do you um, still hold, are you still afraid of the German Nazis or just the Republican Nazis? Um, <laughs> the idea is that Hogan's Heroes got criticism for that. But you've got to remember, when you're on a level like Hogan's Heroes, which is television, right? Yeah. Um, like Phil Silvers had a very sharp sense of humor when he made fun of the military. By the way, the Phil Silvers show, You'll Never Get Rich, um, the Sergeant Bilko show, Eisenhower loved it. Yeah. He thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Um, and you don't get much more of the top of the military establishment than him. Um, but um, I almost got the name back of the little fat guy. Remember the little fat guy? Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, there was uh, uh, Doberman. Doberman. Uh, you got it. Very good. Dober 
but in in when you started getting into Hogan's Heroes, this was all just. In other words, they, when they made Hogan's Heroes, they did not expect people to take this serious. Yeah, but I mean, the point was, there's more stupidity than bad intent. You know, people, oh, I got to, well, he said we should do this. Let's do it. You know, they were pointing out the frail, human frailties that could lead a population to participate as Nazis. You know, not, right. not everybody's an intellectual. They, you know, they're soldiers. They follow orders. It was and it was some now, kind of a consideration of an of a you know have some understanding. Well, not remember just, that that also that these these films came on the heels of not only Stalag Seventeen but The Great Escape or something, yeah. which kind of drew a distinction between the Luftwaffe personnel who were running the POW camps they weren't mm -hmm. dealing with the concentration camps, um, the Luftwaffe personnel and the Nazis. And the whole threat of being sent to the Russian front, the Gestapo and the SS were bet, were truly evil guys. And that kind of was the situation. Hogan's Heroes was just a sticky comedy that, that played off that. But in Hogan's Heroes, yeah, they, they didn't present SS people, diehard Nazis, as, uh, as, you know, sympathetic comedic foils. And also in the show... The Allies, of course, there was, more, in other words, it was a little American top-heavy there, but, um, but the, the, the POWs, the Allied POWs, were always getting the better of the Germans, and the Germans were considered bumbling. Yeah, so, uh, you know, i got, I got to bring up another topic, state. which there's a th there hasn't been a movie that uh, was ironic or comedic about the Iraq wars. Uh, the, yet. Not yet. So there was only three kings, you know. Uh, maybe there was others. There was uh, the, the down and um, uh, it's not the Iraq wars, but uh, well, something down. Is... You know, the the, the the one Ethan Hawke, the helicopter falls down, and we lo lost sixteen guys got shot. The uh, in Sudan, I think. Oh, not in, in Somalia. You mean in Somalia? Down. Something down. What was but it that called? Done, that's done very seriously. That's not. That's I know, right? That's the only. But it shows us losing, so it's critical yeah. or to some degree. But right, it's always sympathetic but to no, the U.S. That, cause. It's not criticizing. That had, that had DOD support. So right, but there's it, nothing it, there. Right? Do we haven't had anything? Depicted, you know, heroic U.S. Right, military, right, 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 right. Whenever there. Oh, and then they, they just. One of the most recent one, really pathetic, Sniper, the Sniper, American Sniper. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's, well. You, pathetic, people pathetic. People have correctly argued that it's very racist. It's it, very racist. It kind of assumes that the, um, even the Hurt Locker kind of, you know, yeah. there's a, a, at the very least, an Orientalist attitude towards Muslims. Right. And well, in the case of Sniper, it's just flat out racist about the people, the Iraqis he kills there, you know. They're yeah, just, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and there was a... They deserve was, to die there, you know, they'll blow up their own kids. Golden, and, gold, like there that, were some yeah. uh, Israeli producers that kept making these anti-Arab movies uh, in about 20 years yeah. ago. Golden Globa, Globus or whatever. And there no, was there's, always, I mean, there, there's a good, there's a good documentary on that in, were, on that they, in general. Globus would have made any movie... Uh, that made money. They, um, I mean, yeah, whether yeah, but it's you know, usually they, anti. Look, it's a, it's a long yeah, it was evil, evil. Wait, wait, Mike. Evil. I just want to you know, all come. Yeah, evil Arabs have a yeah. long tradition in Hollywood movies. Right. You know, right. going back to the you know the Sheikh. You know, either Arabs or sand, sand, um, sand and sandal movies. You know, or or, <laughs> or, or uh, evil uh, Puerto. Or the evil Puerto grubby, Rican drug The dealers, grubby, you know, you know um, vizier who, you know, right. <laughs> is after the white woman and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, you know. From the beginning of film. From the very beginning of cinema. Yeah. That, there's that a good, there's a good documentary. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Two exceptions. Rudolph Valentino and Sean Connery uh, with, uh, you know, where he played the, as a uh, sultan. In uh, yeah, in, 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 a couple in of line, exceptions. But, okay, sure. But in comedies, if you look at the at the Hope and Crosby movies, for instance. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Always, I mean, talk. You know, I mean, they're funny, but <clears throat> some of the stuff is 
Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so do you think and, there's hope for that? So, Some, there, we'll get to the point where we can have something yeah, uh, I, satiric I can, or comedy about the U.S. I can think of another Iraq. Well, it's, it's again, it's a Gulf. It's a first Gulf War movie. Yeah. It's um, it's somewhat satirical. You ever see um Jarhead? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because I mean, it's satirical to a point because they're still sticking to um. The actual guy, it's it's whose life it's based on, Anthony Swafford. But, you know, they put in a lot of anti-military, you know, because he had, that's what was in his memoirs, his his opinion of the Marines. And after going through, you know, the and the ridiculousness of that war, um, you know, and, you know, his own personal feelings that he realized were wrong afterwards about wanting to basically go out and kill an Iraqi before the war was over. It's like a lot of soldiers have that, you know. Uh, I went to war basically well, so I, I would you know, shoot somebody. You know, um, I, I wouldn't see consider that comedic. There were some things that could be taken satirical. No, it's 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 it's, it. it's it's satirical because again, that's that was in the the guy's memoir in the first place. Is yeah. Well, Kubrick's yeah, gone. Kubrick's gone, but. Very, he was very cynical. He came out very cynical about the military after. Well, well through. Kubrick's gone, but he's about the only one who could pull off doing a satire movie about 9-11, you know, so, so it'll yeah. probably never happen. And by the way, remember one thing about Kubrick, he, he had to be pulled back when he was filming Dr. Strangelove. Yeah. He wanted to end the movie with a pie fight in the war room. A pie um, fight? Yeah, a pie yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, between the Soviets fight. and the, yeah, and like yeah, George E. Scott. <laughs> it's a pie fight and then the world blows up. Well, um, that would have been better. Okay, so that's it. Let's wrap it up because yep, I want to get something okay. to eat. It was a good time to wrap it up.